So hello everyone. Welcome to our next uh, Visiting Cartesian uh, lecture series. Uh, I'm Petr Knobloch. I'm running the MA Future Design program at uh, the School of Art and Design. And uh, I'm pleased to announce our next speaker uh, tonight or in the afternoon in Michigan and uh, maybe in the morning uh, somewhere else in different time zones, uh, Carla Diana. Uh, Carla is a product designer who's uh, focused uh, mainly on interaction uh, products, interaction design and robots. She's also a design educator. She's running a 4D design program at uh, the Cranbrook Academy of Art in Michigan. She's also a well-known uh, writer and uh, author. She's been writing for uh, periodics such as uh, uh, New York Times, and she currently published uh, her second book, second, right? Mm -hmm. About robots, yeah, that's the book. And she should speak uh, today about uh, what 4D means, uh, about the program at uh, Cranbrook, uh, and also about her new book. And I believe that she will also walk us through the facilities uh, at Kremlin. So please welcome Carla. And Carla, all the audience is yours. Thank you. The, is the, uh, the story of a new beginning. And it's very appropriate because uh, Petra and I actually met as students in the 2D and 3D design departments, respectively at uh, Cranbrook Academy of Art. And I still remember our first, pro we were given a project in first, first year and we made this box that, and we collaborated. And it was a box that had a motor that spun on the inside so that it became this drum that also could um, glow from the inside and show messages on every side of it. I don't think we even have pictures of that. Um, so uh, in 1997, I came here to Cranbrook Academy of Art. And as many of you are students and you know, uh, the um, school experience is a journey and it's a journey in finding yourself. And I was uh, very excited about design and looking at things um, the way that a traditional product designer would and then remembered that I had this love for code and as a kid, I had uh, the benefit of being in a program where I learned to do some computer code. And so at some point during my graduate school education, those things started to come together. And I started exploring ways of having objects that just appeared virtually and were programmed or ways of um, thinking about a future where we would be able to program physical objects, they had digital behavior. And uh, I remember uh, our, the, um, our professors are called artists in residence at the time saying to me, oh, what you're working on is not just a new project, it's a new way of being as a designer. And that was really something that even though I didn't fully comprehend or understand, I really latched onto and sunk my teeth into and decided to run with. And so built a career around this focus, always just looking for opportunities where the physical and the digital intersected. Um, and they weren't always the most available opportunities and they weren't always the most lucrative opportunities. But for me, I knew that they were my opportunities and where I wanted my focus to be. So I wound up working for a number of great uh, design firms. At one point, I worked at Karen Rashid's office. I worked for, at Frog Design. I worked for many years at a firm called Smart Design where I also started an interaction lab. And uh, this Neato robot vacuum is an example of the kind of thing that I worked on where um, um, I led the interaction efforts that, of course, included thinking about the physical presence, but um, also really included a lot of methods in thinking about how does it sound, how does it move, um, at what point we have a design that where the, um, the robot itself has messages that glow through the shell of it. So thinking about the, the, that light, that typeface, 
And you know, I really think about, you know, we talk a lot about three modalities, light, sound, and movement, which become the material that I love to work in. Um, after my time at SMART, I started my own studio where I would work with clients, but always continually challenged myself to do projects that involved this intersection of the physical and the digital. And in particular, I love also thinking about alternative materials and how we might have electronics um, work in materials that are a little less expected for an uh, electronic device. So this is a thing that I call the clever coat rack. One of the things that I was talking a lot about and I had started teaching at this point as well was how um, we have the potential to have a lot of capability and a lot of features in all of our products. But I wanted to question should we have it? We can, so this is an internet connected coat rack that could potentially have a Facebook feed and stock market quotes and a whole bunch of other things. But I really wanted to focus on context. What is the what do we need from an internet connection at precisely the moment you're interacting with this product at precisely that place and time? And it's just simply the weather. So the high weather, the low weather, and something about the conditions. Is it going to snow or is it going to be sunny? Is it going to rain? So that you have this communication with the object and can make a split second decision of what to grab. Um, the next thing I wanna show you is, um, oh, I don't have that video. Uh, this is a project that I love to show um, because it really speaks to the importance of exploration in my studio and it's called the Lickestra and it's an ice cream orchestra. And I was collaborating with a food designer named Emily Baltz and a musical composer named Aaron Dyer. And for me, again, it was pushing the boundaries of how we interact with our physical world. And we're used to thinking of swiping on screens or touching buttons, but could we actually have licking be the thing that was the interface? So in this project, um, what we did is we conducted an orchestra of ice cream performers. And I have sensors that are embedded within the cones, these plastic cones. And we asked for volunteers to emerge from these boxes so that they actually couldn't use their hands. And um, then the different parts of the music uh, play through the act of licking the ice cream, which then triggers a capacitive sensor. Um, and then a lot of my career wound up being focused on robots. I was a visiting assistant professor at Georgia Tech where there was a new lab that was being developed that was called the Socially Intelligent Machines Lab. And it was a lab that was focused on an entirely new field that I wasn't familiar with that's called social robotics. And that field is all about studying how we might interact with our machines in a totally intuitive way. Meaning that all we need to bring to our interaction interaction to operate the machine is what we know from our behavior as a human being. So um, I worked with a professor whose name is Dr. Andrea Tamaz on a whole series of robots that I've written a lot about. Um, and uh, this is uh, one of the robots that's more abstract. And um, some of you might recognize the Connect camera. I mean, it's essentially a robot arm that can walk around, well, it's actually on wheels, with a Kinect camera and an arm that can move up and down. And for me, what's really particularly important is communicating to people how you use this robot. And so exaggerating the ears, emphasizing the field of view, um, and uh, letting people know that it's something you can talk to, it's something that can see, was really important for me. Since that time, some of my collaborations with um, Andrea, as well as her Socially Intelligent Machines Lab, which moved to the University of Texas in Austin, included developing an entire company, which is now, um, I don't actually know, they, have, they're, they are burgeoning. They're a growing company in Austin, Texas called Diligent Robotics. And what um, the company's been developing is a hospital robot. And um, the real benefit of the product uh, is its ability to be a social robot. And, um, you know, we might think of this as kind of like, well, it's kind of a doll. Why do we need something like that? But uh, the benefit is really, again, taking the cognitive load away from having to operate a machine. And particularly a machine like this 
that's complex to train, complex to use, and is going to be in this really, really busy environment where you don't necessarily have time to put in a, um, a code for stop button or anything like that. Um, and so this work was really built on a lot of research. It also, um, I am part of a team with fantastic engineers, both software engineers, as well as mechanical engineers, and a whole team of researchers that are constantly talking to the nurses and the technicians and the patients and everyone else in the hospital setting. And the bottom line is that the nurses were exhausted. They were hiding out in closets because they were forced to be assembling kits. And it was things that a robot could easily do and then give them back time and pleasure in their work to work with patients. Um, so that's what I do. And then a big part of my practice is actually outreach. So as Petra mentioned, I've written for a number of publications. Um, the Atlantic uh, Popular Science asked me to do a piece around um, autonomous vehicles and some of the ethical considerations there and the importance of design. Um, I also try to have projects for myself that challenge me to think about um, what I see as emerging technology in society. So at one point I knew that 3D printers were starting to become ubiquitous. And I um, worked on a children's book where everything that appears in the book can be downloaded and 3D printed. I'm actually wearing the, the, the necklace from this book that is um, 3D printed and then cast in silver. Um, so my latest book is called My Robot Gets Me. And it really is a summary of all of this work that I've done with these great researchers and um, thinking not so much about robots. And some of the robots that I worked on literally have eyes and arms and, and can, can walk around. And uh, that's not my vision of what we need in our everyday lives. But what was super exciting as a designer was the uh, potential to have those types of interactions show up in our everyday objects. So for example, um, there was a conference room um, camera, a meeting camera when I was at Smart Design that would do this simple gesture of turning around and then, it, and it just had what we would call two degrees of freedom in the robotics world. It could spin and it could pivot its head up and down. Um, but what I noticed from that is that it would do this really human gesture of turning its, itself around. And it was just a cylinder on a spindle. It would spin around and then it would, it would tilt. And it really felt like a person turning around and bowing their head as if they were taking a nap and looking away. So that's really the premise of the book and really the focus of a lot of my work. And the focus of a lot of my work with clients is this abstraction and thinking about and learning from um, researchers. I also do a podcast, it's called the RoboPsych Podcast, where I work with a PhD psychologist and we talk about all of the ways that um, these kind of abstract gestures tug at our heartstrings, so to speak, or make us feel like we're interacting with something that is alive, even though we know full well that it's not alive. And there have been, you know, a, um, a number of research studies around things like the Roomba that, um, as soon as it's auton seems autonomous and seems like it's moving around the space, people want to give it names. People um, attribute human behaviors to it. If you go on some Amazon reviews, and I was surprised to see it up until this day, because I had first researched this uh, over 10 years ago. And I would read things like people said, I feel so badly for Stephen, he's stuck under the couch. And um, when I was writing the book, and I finished it this summer, I looked back at the Amazon reviews, and people were still saying this kind of stuff. Like, um, I, I, you know, I can't, I really, I admire my, my helper, Clyde, and I hate when he doesn't do a good job. And, you know, just talking that way is just really fascinating. I think from a psychological point of view and something that we as designers want to think about. 
So for the book, I put together a framework because one of the challenging things in my work and really one of the most challenging things for 4D design, and we're gonna visit a few of the students today, is the fact that you have to keep so many things in your mind at one time. You really are thinking about what the physical form of the object is. You're thinking about the light and the sound and the movement. You're thinking about what messages are being expressed. Um, and you're also having to, you know, coordinate all of that with the technology. So it's pretty challenging. And in being so challenging, it's easy to lose sight of what's important. So the focus of the book that's called My Robot Gets Me is um, really using the idea of social interaction as the core value that unites everyone on a design team, as well as helps a designer to constantly remind themselves what the most important aspect of what they're creating is. And in order to do that, I developed this framework that is kind of like an onion where one thing builds on the next. And so we start with presence, which is the physical form and how important that is. And then it goes on to expression or the way, what I keep calling sound light and movement. Um, and then we have interaction, like what are the sensors? How does that thing, it can give us messages, but how does it understand messages from us? And that happens through microphones, sensors, um, camera systems, radar, all the, you know, a whole host of that. And I talk a lot about it in the book. Context is really one of the things that's most challenging for robotics because it's really a very, very human thing. Understanding not only the how, um, and the where, kind of like the coat rack, but also in a sense, the why. So understanding what the state of mind of the person is. And that includes taking information from calendars, taking information from that person's personal history. Um, and there's a, there's a lot to that. Um, and then finally, ecosystems. When we have a number of devices that can communicate, like I might have a fitness tracker that can communicate with my scale, that can communicate with my bicycle, etc. cetera. Um, and there's also just a core way of thinking about products that I encourage in the book. And we're used to, in traditionally in product design, thinking about the object as a thing into which we put messages that are kind of pre-baked. And um, the designer writes this, this script and then the script comes out with the instructions. But what we're starting to see is the product as an entity unto itself so that it has artificial intelligence and we're only feeding it with a set of rules, but it's actually starting to come up with its own script. And how do we think about products in that way? So, um, uh, animators do this uh, exercise that's called the flower sack exercise. And I liken this to what we do with sound, light, and motion, where we're not, again, literally looking at a head and eyeballs, but we're thinking about how something can be abstract. And, you know, something like light, we might have a single light that can, even a single light can have a lot of expression. It can be a a number of different colors. It can be brighter or dimmer. Um, it can blink, flash, as opposed to glow. And then once we start getting to multiple lights, then that can be animated and we get even more expression. And then when we add more lights, we get a small kind of matrix. I use this sometimes in the faces of my robots. And then of course, ultimately we have a screen. And um, the uh, ecosystems is something I've already mentioned. And the other thing that I you know, really stress in the book, particularly at the end, are thinking about the ethics of our product relationships. And what we wanna consider are the um, implications of what happens when we have products that we have a relationship with that can then persuade us to do things. And um, 
It can persuade us to have unhealthy habits. It can persuade us to um, purchase things that maybe are not good for us. And as designers, I really encourage us to think about uh, what it is and have an understanding of what the goal of the relationship is and think about po vulnerable populations as well as so many of the other technical considerations that have a big impact on ethics, um, including privacy, including uh, vulnerability to hackers, et cetera. But um, I, uh, uh, ultimately, we are just at the beginning of thinking about designing all of this. And so when I said that this story starts at Cranbrook and ends at Cranbrook with a new beginning, what happened a few years ago, three years ago, is I was um, contacted by a friend who didn't realize that I had been a Cranbrook alum. And she said, I've been asked to, to um, seek out people in industry who might be a good fit to create a new program. And the program is being called 4D Design and they're looking for someone to come in and bring a vision. And I thought of you immediately. And um, I had just started a new job at Parsons School of Design. And she said, maybe you don't wanna look at new opportunities. And I said, um, probably any other opportunity I would not even consider. But to start a new program at Cranbrook is really a fantastic opportunity and really a perfect fit and a chance to bring this intersection of the physical and the digital that I've been working on, this idea of social interaction and bring it to a place like Cranbrook that has a rich history in the arts and design. Um, the Eameses were here doing all of their vast exploration and creating new materials and new manufacturing methods. Um, many sculptors such as Harry Vertoya, Carl Millis, Marshall Fredericks. Um, Saarinen was uh, instrumental in starting the campus as well as launching the first architecture program. And there were many, many others. So I felt like it was a place that was really rooted in thinking about the physical presence of an object, the importance of materiality, the importance of the relationship to the um, humanity and the human body. And, uh, and it was exciting to bring technology to that place. Um, so we have a really fluid curriculum. Um, the beauty of the Cranbrook curriculum is that we don't have a set number of courses that get written at one point and then they just run for decades, but we have the ability to um, be very nimble and respond to what I call today's shifting perspectives. So we're, um, we just wrapped up actually a group discussion. We have a group check-in typically at once a week or so. And we were talking about a lot of um, these things that come up around robotics, around um, how they're starting to show up in our everyday lives, even though we didn't necessarily consent to them. And what do we think about them? And what kind of decisions do we want to make as creative people? So we're looking at product behaviors. We're looking at software, expressive coding, embedded electronics, um, mixed reality, voice control, conversational interfaces. Certainly AI is part of our conversation, uh, 3D printing, prosthetics, telepresence. Um, and the way that we do that, even though we have no classes, we actually, I think of it as one big class where we have a number of workshops and visitors who come in. So there's intensive learning experiences. And then the core of the education happens when students are developing their own projects and we meet for in-depth critiques to discuss those. So we start out with a culture of tinkering. So everybody gets a workshop from me around Arduino, and um, thinking and learn and just the basics of the code and not so much about that technology, but around the resources and how do we go and look for examples? How do we modify code? Why would we want to look for examples? What kind of examples could we look for? And then we've had a series of really great workshops. So we had a fellow named Timmy Oyadeji who came in and um, uh, along with Elena Morales, and they did a workshop around um, gesture and machine learning and how we might use that to control the objects in our environment. And so all of the students learned about 
how the computer vision sees our bodies, sees our faces as well as our hands, and um, how we might use that as an input to control the world around us. We also had some really interesting discussions around um, camera vision as opposed to, Timmy's been using something called Pro, uh, Project Soli. He's now a researcher at Google and Project Soli um, involves using radar as opposed to cameras. So there are some benefits in the privacy realm around that. Um, there's lots to talk about. We also recently had a fellow named Motomichi Nakamura come in and do a workshop around projection mapping. So all of the students uh, did, uh, we did one, and, and we're all virtual this, well, no, we're all physical this year, but uh, doing everything in our hybrid way. So our visitors have come in and they've done the workshops with us remotely. So Motomichi, um, Timmy was in the UK, Motomichi, is in, um, and I think Elena was, in, I don't know if she was in the UK or she was in Spain. Uh, Motomichi was in New York. Um, some of the others you'll see have been uh, in different places around the world, but we've been able to do a lot with remote learning. Um, and then, but the students are here because we are a studio-based education, as opposed to sitting in classrooms next to one another, the students have been working in their studio spaces. And again, we'll see some of their spaces in just a few minutes. So I'm going to race through this so that we can get to that. Cause that's the, really the interesting part. Um, we had a woman named Sophie Kahn do a lecture with us in a discussion. She, um, has built a career as an artist around, um, scanning and 3D printing around the human form and looking at the history of representing the human body and and how we um, take that representation um, and express it back and how we think about particularly the female form and what ways that we can manipulate things like he, she'll do things like take a 3D scanner and actually move it around while it's scanning as part of her artistry. Um, we had a fellow named Matt Kenyon, who's actually at the University of, at Buffalo, and he did a really fantastic lecture with us. And some of these are online, so I might be able to share those with you, Petra. I know that you have your Val of uh, Visiting Artist Lecture Series is phenomenal and everyone's getting overloaded with talks, but there's some really great talks in our, in our um, um, archive as well. Um, so some of these were recorded and I think Matt's and Sophie's were, um, and I think Timmy's as well. So Matt came and he also did virtual studio visits. So he met individually one-on-one -on -one with the students about their work, but he's really looking at some, some critical ideas around um, commerce and um, capitalism and how we can use created artifacts to get people to um, think about things that might otherwise seem invisible. Uh, and then ultimately we have this exquisite campus. So we're part of a larger educational community that has 318 acres. And so a lot of the students think about doing projects that are outdoors. Actually one of our second year students, Steve Kuipers, has a um, construction, a giant construction LED sign that he's having people contribute to as part of his degree show. And it's um, actually located up here right on this path in the peristyle. We also have a science museum that's part of our campus. So I'm particularly excited about 4D being this hybrid of science and art. And I wanna talk a bit about the students and I gotta check on time. Um, so we have a number, uh, we've been doing as much as we could when it was warm and it's getting warm again, where we actually had critiques and um, uh, group um, field trips as part of way to do our discussion, which I think are some things that we might keep even um, beyond pandemic times. Um, we did some seminars outside, you know, this is Meryl Norlander, who um, I think is part of our discussion. I think she's online right now with us. I think, I think. Um, 
And Zoom is so weird. I just see the screen. I don't see you guys when I'm presenting. But I want to talk a little bit about student work. Before we even had uh, full-time 4D students, I brought in a, a couple of electives. So Cody Norman was one of our electives. He's been working with the community locally here in Detroit, which is actually very robot rich because there are a lot of robots behind the scenes in the, in the manufacturing environments and they have an enormously steep learning curve in terms of being able to operate them and so they've started bringing in artists so um, there's a place called Ballard International that brought in artists to work on um, ways to interfa interface with their factory robots. So Cody is one of those people and he's continuing to do research around that. He had a show um, and so this was one of our field trips before the uh, pandemic. Uh, well, also part of our first group was a fellow named Michael Candy, who builds large scale robots with um, that feature light structures. So this is a walking robot um, that was part of a Biennale in Australia. So he's in Australia this year and is gonna be joining us again um, he was in Australia during the pandemic and will be joining us again in the fall. Um, but he is really very interested again in this relationship between the human, the human body and the robot is kind of a creature or an entity. Um, we were right at the pandemic time, we were in the midst of prepping for a group show where um, we were gonna show a number of pieces. This is his um, little sunfish robot where he had seen a robot that was part of um, scoping out the Fukushima disaster. And it was a, a scouting robot and he recreated it, but not for the purpose of using it for scouting, but actually to use it as a character in a film and to think about this robot breaking away and bringing some radioactive material with it. And it really sort of spoke to, and this is, and he then showed it and he's got some great scenes of the robot interacting with sea creatures, but it really kind of speaks to the potential for narrative between machines and people and how the machine itself becomes an actor, a social actor, we would say. And um, I think it's important for us as designers to talk about that. Um, this is then a scene of Meryl, who's one of our first years, and she brought some of her practice that was um, is a very thriving um, art practice around gender and sexuality and thinking about identity, but and also using um, folding structures as part of the form with which she works. And she then brought some of those and started to use motors and started to automate and then started actually looking at some of these objects that were part of her performances that became these hybrid um, sex toys with new identities. Um, and that's a scene from one of the performances. She also worked on something during this pandemic where there was a friend of hers, this is called the Brock Emotional Support Tool. So a friend of hers was in Paris in a high rise and really suffering from the isolation. And here we were working on these objects to help people be more social. So Meryl started working on this way of thinking about what we had learned from our gesture workshop of how her friend could actually be um, affecting something that Meryl or somebody else could be wearing across the, on the other side of the world. And um, these are just some more experiments around a wearable device. And then taking that further and thinking about creating, an, again, a narrative. And this one's called The Journey to Uranus. Um, uh, Chu, uh, Chen is one of our second year students who's currently showing in our degree show. Oh, this might be a video. Oh, yeah, here we go. Um, so this project is called Second Skin and is thinking about the ways that robotics become prosthetics and then kind of we take cues from our human form and bring those cues into the robotic world, but then the robots actually start to come back full circle and affect us. So he's looking at that whole circle of interaction. 
uh, this is a project from Jerry Lee, one of our second students. It's called the Emotional Hat. So one of the things that we really think about is how is technology affecting us as humans, affecting how we interact with one another? Just as I'm feeling like actually pretty isolated, just talking to a screen, he was thinking about, you know, what happens when we are just looking at our devices um, and having them express emotion for us. So he's got this uh, hat that you wear that does the job of expressing um, and is really getting us to you know question like what are we expressing through our technology and what is that doing to us as humans um this is a piece from um chris k that is around the phenomenon of light and thinking and it's it's a, a exquisite mechanism that spins and will actually transform the room around you um, and there's a bunch of stuff online around the 4D program and, and the sense of what 4D is. But um, I want to get to, and there's lots of ways to get in touch with me, but what I want to do is make sure I have a chance to walk around and I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm going to pop in to a couple of students and say hi to them. So I'm actually gonna switch out of this screen and go to my other um, identity here. So I'm gonna... Okay, here we are. So this is the 4D space. We actually have a gallery here where we can show some of the videos there you see we've got Merrill's video there this is our studio uh, this is our crit room that also doubles as a projection mapping studio we have a grid on the ceiling where we can hang projectors and cameras Emily just showed her work that is a soft robot can we, can we see it it's uh it actually oh it's doing its little thing oh, oh. you know it's a shot it's programmed to be a, um, a fearful, uh, well, well, we had an hour long discussion and there's a lot around the emotion of the robot, but there is a sense of shyness. And so um, the robot needs you to be still and then it will actually emerge and, and do its thing. Um, we have a number of soldering stations here. We have Chen who is experimenting with ferrofluid. I mean, this one, this one, this part, this this piece is kind of not work that perfectly, but I have a small walking sample. Ah, uh, don't watch out. Shen's got a piece in the museum right now. He's one of our second years, all of our second years show in yeah. the museum. Oh, you this can show works. us this little one? Yeah, okay. this one, this one cool. works better. So Chen's been so experimenting with um, ferrofluid. And so in his piece in the museum, he has a number of uh, motors that move a magnet behind the screen. Oh, can you do it from behind? Okay, yeah. And um, he's particularly interested in this as a means of expression and the um, how this connects to the way we do ink and mark making and um, ephemerality. And I can talk about a lot of other things. Thank you, Chen. I'm gonna pop into Vikram. Hey, Hi, Vikram. Hey, what's up? Hi, um, I can show you what's going on. Show us like, what a studio is like. There's a big hand here. I don't know what that's about. That's the, I mean, it's the hand of God. A ton of stuff here. Uh, desk, computer is pretty important for the work that you do here. Um, I have a 3D printer just because, because the ones in the lab tend to be a bit busy. And I got a VR headset recently. Oh, ah, so cool. That a little bit. Um, I keep like a station for soldering and like doing handwork and stuff. Like uh huh. That. Um, and it's good to have snacks or the fridge. Uh -huh. Um, a lot of wood and other materials that I keep over there just so that I can quickly build flames and stuff. Uh huh. And, and paint, glue, just other supplies. Um, you yeah, recently can you talk about the drawing robot? Oh, this is. This it's is not a set up. Whiteboard huh? that's used for like a, a potter machine. So I have two motors mounted here 
and a pen that would hang off of them and it could actually draw images that I feed into it. Um, I don't have a scroll right now, but I have a scroll that would, would print onto and fill up with the scroll. We um we have a lot. Thank you, Vika. We have a lot of our projects on uh, Instagram these days, so that's a great way to um, learn more. Vikram's got a project that's called God Forsaken that shows us. Hi, Emily. Hi. Can you tell us a little bit about your studio and what you work on? Um, I work with pneumatics and soft robotics. Um, and a little bit of sculpture too. Um, right now I'm working on Stephen's vault entry. For oh his, yes, for his um, big, mm -hmm. right, yeah. So I'm just writing a message that's gonna be um, included as part of uh, Stephen's work outside the museum. Uh -huh. so, awesome. Yeah. Emily also does really lovely sketches as um, research for the projects that she's working on and uh, does a lot of mold making. She molded, in, she did enormous experiments around the soft robot and molding. And we've got a couple of other students back here. Oh, we have a kitchen, which is a big part of in pre-pandemic and post-pandemic. I'm going to show just a little bit of the lab, but I want to make sure to leave time for Q and A. Um, so this is our 4D lab. And we do have a number of 3D printers. Um, this is our, our larger format maker bot. We have a couple of presses. Joseph Presses, brilliant and very um, responsive company. Um, we've got a, a form labs for doing resin prints, um, a mini vacuum former. We also, we have a, a main studio, a main shop centrally at school um, that has larger equipment, but this is more just the 4D specific stuff. We have a desktop CNC for um, being able to carve out PC boards. We've got a vinyl cutter. Everybody wants stickers. Who doesn't want stickers? Uh, we also have a room here that's a little isolated for a um, laser cutter and lots of bits and electronic parts. And um, one of the visions for the, three, the 4D program is also to be a digital hub for our whole community. So the fiber department has a um, digital jacquard loom that you see here. And uh, it's housed here in 4D, even though it's part of um, the uh, fiber department and some of our 4D students have been using that. So you can program it and then you are weaving the thing that you put outside. Here is, uh, this is the Dubot robot arm. We've got more soldering, just some simple hand tools. Uh, wearables, of course, are something that I wanna encourage and it's sort of a big part of making the physical and the digital these days, the relationship to the body. So we have sewing station, and mannequins, and things are all kinds of messy here right now because we're in the thick of things. Steve, our second year, um, hacked this, um, one of these claw vending machine toys and allowed artists to then contribute. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's about it. So I'm going to end this part. Uh, here we go. So I'm back. And I know we started 10 minutes after. So if we were going to, if we do have an hour, we still have time for questions. You would like to hear about the book, Carla? Oh, yes. Yeah. So uh, I, talk, I mean, I talked a little bit about some of the principles in the book. It's a lot of what I talk about in the 4D design program. Uh, it's called My Robot Gets Me. It is um, really kind of a culmination of stories from my, the last 20 years of, of working, really. I mean, more really the last 10 years. But um, what I talk about in the book is 
how, you know, we've been, at, we're at a point where there's a lot that we can do technologically, but what should we do? And uh, we can make things incredibly complex and that just makes them more difficult to use. So how can we focus on the thing that lets the technology get out of the way? Uh, you know, in a sense, like that's really the goal of what we're thinking about with this 4D design stuff is to have um, the technology get out of the way. So I mean, like I said a little bit in my presentation, there's this, um, there's this core framework that is the framework that is the the five you know the presence expression interaction um and you know i really come from from way back when you and i were students petter really understanding the importance like that physical presence is really the sort of nut that is the most important thing that everything kind of hangs on. And, you know, even though we talk about technology disappearing and becoming invisible, um, really we still want to think about the material that something is made in, the shape that something is, how that shape communicates to us. Um, I've got a number of uh, interviews in the book with folks who are head of design or, um, parts of different organizations. And one of them is with a guy named Rocky Jacob, who was the lead creative director for the Nest camera when they were developing an outdoor security camera. And he talked a lot about this, you know, what would seem to people like it's a, just a decorative thing, which is the um, little shield that, sh that goes on top of a security camera, right? Like security cameras have this sort of little shield, right? And he said that he really pushed his engineering team hard to try to get rid of that little shield because that, that little shield felt like a police hat. And it made this device, they wanted it to be for consumers for their home to think about all kinds of things, to think about, um, I'm waiting for a package or I want to, you know, be able to greet the people who are coming to my door or, um, you know, and security is certainly part of that, but they didn't want that to be your core relationship around this sort of aspect of fear. So he, um, he said it was really important not to have the police hat. And I really, I use that story in the book because it really speaks to the importance of presence and, um, you know, there's another project that I uh, re that was recently that I recently got the patent on that I worked on with a drummer whose name is Conrad Meisner, and um, he's a drummer. And he said every metronome I operate is this sort of like little thing. He's like, I'm there and I'm performing, and then I have to go and like operate these little buttons like this on this like this little plastic thing and he said I think there's a better way and so together with him and um, Ted Booth Mike Glazer we worked on a device that can be an, operated entirely by the drummer in the midst of his performance so it's called the click brick and it um, has a mount so that it mounts to the drum kit like just like a cymbal or other drum and you operate it entirely with the drumstick. So you turn it on like this, you turn it off like this, you, there's a dial where you can dial in the tempo, but you can also actually hit the tempo and have it match. Um, and uh, he's been taking it on the road and you know, people say like, what is that thing? That's great, how can I get one? And, and it's a whole, um, that's a whole company that was launched that is, so the whole company business part of it is, a whole other story and um, Ted and Conrad are the core of that company and they are handling because I get a lot of people who after I do talks like this and they go I want to buy one of those and, and we're they're just starting to produce them uh, soon but manufacturing is a whole other project unto itself I get my so that's some of the stuff around the book. Yeah, it starts with presence and then it goes to interaction and then it talks about AI and how AI can be used 
to help us understand our state of mind and then have an object respond appropriately. Super. So any questions, guys? And uh, you guys in the audience, can you turn your cameras on that uh, Carla can see the faces behind uh, the names? Yeah, these Zoom presentations are driving me bananas. I just did a book launch and it was a webinar format and it was great because it was with a journalist and we had a great conversation, but like I couldn't see any of the people. Yeah, yeah. And I see a couple of my students who are also on the screen. Like I see Chris Kay and I see Ryan Janina. I see Meryl, although I also saw Meryl in the kitchen, so. Um, if, if no one has questions, uh, I have uh, some. Uh, I would be curious to hear, uh, Mimo, your son is a preschool kid now, right? He's uh, kindergarten. Yeah, mm -hmm. kindergarten. So, and he's in this uh, fantastic environment of Cranbrook and uh, 4D design facilities. Do you think uh, it is uh, influencing him in some way? Uh, because he's the generation of kids uh, which uh, are absolutely natural with uh, the technology and uh, all the mobile devices. Uh, how do you think uh, it can influence him to be in such environment and around the people who are in the campus? Yeah, I think the term is digital native, right? So, so first of all, I do have to say with the pandemic, um, MIMO is not allowed in the studios. So, and that's a big sadness for me, that small sadness in the larger context of um, everything else that's going on with the pandemic. But um, I've, I've been very excited about him. You know, when you and I were here, um, Scott and Lori Makala had their kids in the studio all the time. And I always thought like, what, an, what an amazing experience to, to, to see everything that's going on. But even kind of small things, I think even, even if he's not coming here physically, I, I definitely see that he is being um, influenced by the work that's happening here at 4D. Like we did just have the projection mapping workshop with Motomichi. And so as part of that, um, a lot of us, I was just communicating with Chris about um, projectors. A lot of us were just doing a lot of experimentation with projectors. And so I brought a projector home and just to like, like that's now one of his materials. Mm -hmm. Like he'll just say, can we use that thing where we make it big on the wall? And, mm -hmm. you know, we think about and, and, and we'll do things like look, look at photos that way. And so I think it's really changing the way that he, he thinks, but um, you guys have any questions for my students? Yeah, I, I can hear uh, or see some. Uh, Metanchu, who's here on uh, Zoom, is asking, AI robots are going to take over most of the jobs in the future. And with the increase uh, in population, large amount of population is going to be unemployed. Don't you think it's going to next major problem that humans are going to face? Wow. There's certainly, hey, Ison. Um, there's certainly, uh, I mean, that's certainly a big discussion and a big economic, political issue that we've already felt. Look, we're here in Detroit. I mean, it was it, it even just you know manufacturing really completely changed the the face of economics here and um, and hurt a lot of people in terms of being suddenly not prepared. Uh, I think that there will always be something that is replacing the jobs before us. And we do, we use robot, I mean, the core for using robotics is around what we call the three Ds, um, dirty, dangerous, and, oh, what's the third one? <laughs> um, deadly. Um, no, deadly is the da dangerous. Oh, somebody help me out here. Um, Anyway, undesirable things. So I do think that like, like the Moxie robot that, that I work on, like the nurses are actually uh, here in the US, very short staff, very exhausted. Um, they are line, landing up in the hospital themselves because of the ways that they have to work. So I feel really good about working for a company like that, that I feel is giving the nurses the ability to do 
the human part of their work um, and doesn't take away from their opportunity. They're not getting opportunities taken away. Um, with that said, I, I think, so I also think, you know, we could look at something like, um, when I was in my first job, one of my first jobs, I worked for the Hearst Corporation in a very fancy building in Manhattan and somebody's job full time was to operate the elevator. And many people all over New York City had that job and they lost that job. And so I, I don't feel like the answer is bring back the job of press of sitting in a box all day pressing a button. I think that the answer is continually finding creative ways for there is, we always humans always create something new. We can look back and say, how do we think that we would have done anything beyond the telephone? And then we, you know, and then look at what telephone means to us today or look at what communication means to us today. I think that we need to be forward looking. I do really think that things like a universal basic income are interesting ideas for, I do think that work, all of the constructs around work are of course, constructs of our creations as human beings. So how can we create a new construct around the eight hour day? Super, thank you. There is another question from Facebook, uh, which is related kind of, how do you think the robotics could have uh, helped to manage the pandemic in any way? Oh, you know, the, um, I mean, they, they were, there's actually a thing that I write about in the book at the end where I think the, there have been a lot of robotics helping the pandemic. There's been a lot of um, disinfecting robots, delivery robots, um, even, you know, Moxie, the robot that I helped uh, create um, delivers COVID tests because there's just like so many more COVID tests and they need to get delivered right away. And, the, um, and, and so I think, um, I think the pandemic was helped by, and not to mention telepresence robots, right? There was a lot of like, all of a sudden our, our nieces and nephews and grandparents are on that wouldn't normally be ha having this virtual presence, having this virtual presence. And so I think that, I think that actually we didn't have enough te like true telepresence robots that are like roving around our spaces and giving us a better experience than this experience that I keep complaining about. But um, I, I, what I actually talk about in the book is how a little bit sad that made me because I started seeing all of these articles about like, you know, robotics are going to do this for the pandemic. Robotics are going to do that. Robotic, you know, I, I think there's, I think they think that there, it was the, the right time for robotics to explode, but my, I don't want to see us rely on robots out of a sense of fear. And, uh, you know, I think that, that there are tools that can help us, but I don't really want to, you know, I don't want to see everybody in their own little autonomous vehicle afraid to like be sitting next to somebody else. Like I want to see public transportation and, um, you know, I don't want to see people not wanting to, to touch each other and touch things. And anyway, so there's my little rant, but. Um. And I think that's it so far. Any other questions to Carla? Hi, Carla and Isa. Hi, Isa. Hi. Nice to meet um, you. Nice Where are you in the too. world? I'm in Prague. Okay. Isa is one of our second year students. Ah, oh, super cool. Yeah, um, Petr actually recommended your book to me a while ago. I can't remember, but when he did, it was not available yet. So, you know, it kind of slipped my mind, but, but now I absolutely intend to buy your book, but just in case, um, well, what I want to ask you is if maybe you talk about, um, cause my project is about, it's a virtual experience. So I'm not really doing anything physical right now, 
but it's about it's about the future of smart homes. So in this virtual experience, I'm just designing this well hypothetical scenario that the AI system is fully integrated into your house and everywhere you go, you can just interact with this, you know, your digital housemate. And in this process, I've decided to like open it to the public so that they can tell me, you know, what their preferences are, what they think about this type of technology. And so far it's been mixed reviews. I would say mostly positive. I mean, I haven't gotten a lot of responses yet, but my question is, you, can you think about like an example where you actively engage, you know, your end users, um, like what sort of process that is for you or, or your students, if, if any? So the, is the question around how do you active, how do you use AI to? No, like how modify? do you, um, how do you approach your end users? Like, um, so you have this design in mind, right? I'm thinking kind of like on a human centered design approach in that, well, it's kind of like, let's say doing a focus group and how they would maybe uh, like this project or this technology or not. Is it something oh, that yeah. you... Yeah, so I, I talk about that a little bit, a little bit in the book. I get into methods and, you know, there are some specific methods that I use with my clients. I mean, in non-pandemic times, I'll actually fly out to um, Diligent in Austin or, and, and I, what I do is a series of workshops and the workshops are really around thinking about the product as again what I would call a social actor and doing what we call a body storming exercise so um, we try to mimic the environment of the hospital setting or if it's the pharmacist let's say visiting the pharmacy we have some shelves we'd have some um, we have some pieces of cardboard that represent the things that the robot needs to pick up and we actually have someone literally play the part of the robot so that we can have the relationship be the focus of the design activity, as opposed to thinking about the materials and the tech, tech and the coding and all of that kind of stuff. Like first have it guide the whole process. And then what I do from those exercises is I'll take video or stills and then turn those into storyboard scenarios that then become a document for the whole team to use around specific situations. So one specific situation might be pick up and delivery of medications. So like, what does that scenario look like? What's involved in that and, and what emerges from that? Um, so I see there's something in the chat. Um, oh, it's a question from Ison. So Ison and I used to work together and she's got, an, and we haven't caught up in a long time, um, an impressive she's a PhD in what's, what's um, you've been focusing on um, medicine and healthcare. <laughs> Yeah, human informatics. I run a lab in, in, uh, in a hospital, a medical fabrication lab. And I've actually met Moxie. Oh. <laughs> they brought to our hospital, yeah. Oh, how cool, how cool. Um, um, I, yeah. yeah, my question is, um, what's the difference between a robot and a device? Is it like an anthropomorphizing or is it agency? Is it because we're considering it more like an entity or... Are they replacing human functions? Um, and that's the difference. Like obviously a robot is a device, but I'm not sure that all devices are robots. Like it seems like it's a semantic distinction. Um, and I love what you just said, social actor. Is that the difference that there's like a social component? But I'm not sure because the, the KUKA machines, the arms are not necessarily social. So Right, right. No, it's an interesting question, right? It's sort of, it's, I mean, it really is a semantic. We talk about it a lot in, in 4D. I see Chris and Ryan are still on the screen with us. We, I mean, we had an interesting discussion once where one of our students said, you know, in Chinese, the word robot means humanoid robot. And I don't consider anything that's not a humanoid a robot. And um, 
you know, I, it really sort of, to me, the more that I work in this and do like the podcast and writing and stuff, the more I think that science fiction and culture um, affects the way that we think about our devices. And because we come from the science fiction that has things like Kit, the autonomous vehicle, or, you know, Rosie, the robot that was supposed to help us clean up, that we're like, our minds are fixated on that relationship. But, you know, one of the people who worked on this book a lot with me is a woman named Dr. Wendy Ju, who's at Cornell Tech. And she liked to say, we, we used to have this discussion as well, right? Because I don't know. So like, it's, I think it's, I think it's a semantic and I think it's really different for every person. Even, you know, each of my students has a different point of view of what constitutes a robot. You know, is a Roomba really a robot? Because it's programmed to bounce off the I walls. Think right? To me, it feels like a pet. So yeah, I consider it more a robot than just like a cleaning device. You know, I don't uh -huh. know if I can consider my computer a robot. I consider that more of an extension. But I guess the Roomba is also an extension doing the things I don't right. like. You know? And isn't it a funny thing? Because the Roomba is so much dumber than your computer. Yeah, like the sure. amount of yeah. smarts are in your computer. Like I mean, the Roomba, like the Nito that I worked on at least has some sort of LIDAR. So it maps out the room. And like the Roomba, at least the earlier versions of the Roomba would was programmed to bounce off the wall, move 10 degrees, and then go somewhere else until it bounces. So, so if you look at these maps of the Roomba, it just like makes this, I'm sure you've seen these images. Um, but the fact that it's on wheels and roves and like m makes its physical presence um, known in your environment, in a, in a, I think the fact that it moves makes it and, and has some decision-making ability. So Wendy likes to say a robot is anything that does something for us on our behalf. Yeah, that sounds pretty broad though. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty broad. <laughs> right, like is a dishwasher a robot? Yeah, why is a Roomba a robot and a dishwasher not, you know? Cause they're essentially like, it's cause it moves. So, uh, yeah, I think it has to do with embodying the, 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 yeah, the embodiment. I think it has to do with the dynamic aspect of embodiment, right? And so once the body is able to move, because even we have some things like even just the Jibo didn't move around, but it, but it tilted its head or the Echo Show does this thing where it moves and or even the thing that I talked about, the Polycom camera felt like it, like it was, a, it had a body and had a body that, but it's not, but we have, I mean, I would call, would you call an Amazon Echo a robot? I think it's really, it's really different in different contexts and it's really different for different people. Thank you. That, I think that I like that dynamic embodiment that, yeah. Yeah, we'll go with that. <laughs> Um, Any more what, about, what about you guys? What about you guys, um, Ryan and Chris? Do you guys have questions for the? Do you have like things you want to say about 4D? Tell us some gossip about Carla. <laughs> um, specifically, I don't know. Um, I mean, I'm putting you uh, on the spot. I'm sorry, it's but all, it's fun to have you good. here. Well, thanks. Um, <clears throat> I think the, the last question that you that was asked, I mean, we specifically talked about that question for, I think, like, like an hour and a half. multiple <laughs> days, at least. Yeah. And even off offline, it was, uh, it was definitely a topic that was of heated discussion. But um, I always like to think about it, like, you know, it's kind of the, the whole idea of what is art? How do you define art? What, is, what does it mean? And it's, it's an internal internal situation also with cultural it's kind of cultural as well but i don't know uh about 4d uh man it's a, there's there's so much stuff that i've learned here that i didn't think that i was going to learn i didn't come in thinking i was going to learn and it's really great i'll just say that yeah it's different than what graduate school is different than what 
what one walks in the door expecting it to be, I think. I have, I have a question about the program, uh, uh, about something which uh, we have been experiencing here at the Future Design Program. How difficult is uh, for you guys, because people are coming from different cultures, uh, different environments, uh, different countries, uh, different religions. Uh, how difficult is uh, to somehow and how fast you can find uh, the common language, you know, because if you speak about some uh, terms like, uh, uh, let's say, human centered design, or even art, or robot, etc., everybody has unique mind and unique uh, perspective. So uh, we've been experiencing that it takes a while to somehow find the uh, same language and being on same, same page. Yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I, okay, if that's a question for me or is that a question for Carla? No, I think you guys, you guys yeah, can- Probably you, yeah, more students. Okay, um, so I think, whether you're from a different country or not, you're going to have, you're going to struggle with that wherever you are. Um, it's, I think, just giving people um, extra, uh, or just understanding that people are on the same page, that you're going to be not agreeing on every single thing. I mean, that's that's the the obvious, straightforward answer. Um, but I think also coming with an open mind and realizing that you can learn things that you may or may not have had exposure to, especially if somebody's from another cult culture, country, uh, or just generally social background. Um, I think having, because we have a, a lot of international students here, having a, um, a, a wide variety of cultures has really allowed us to expand our social identity uh, way more. So I think that's cool. Um, Does that answer your I, question? I, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I, I find this, this is a question that I ask myself often. I think about it. Um, ever since coming to Cranbrook, it's really shined bright in my mind as far as like language, linguistics, and sort of a universal language we can speak together. I come from a ba industrial design background, a traditional industrial design background. So we rigor rigorously studied the methodology and the process and my classmates and colleagues and work you know we spoke the same language the same jargon so here what cranbrook is to me and it's it's bigger than the 4d department we're like a cultural hub of contemporary art and i believe that this is one of the most progressive places i come from california Oregon West Coast primarily and it's it's considered you know progressive for lack of a better term and and the the progressiveness of Cranbrook is like next level like we're we're talking about future we're in my mind we're developing language for things that there there really isn't language that's being spoken about um, and it can be controversial subjects like um, you know, some things in regards to like what is allowed in a museum and what isn't. There's some, you know, topics around censorship and like how does that influence language? And then there's subjects of like personal identity and, you know, but this is to me, it goes past just the department. Now, when it comes to 4D, we're also creating a language because this is a new field. You mentioned you're working in futures design. We had a lecture recently with someone who really ling linguistically impressed me, um, who was in the field of future, El Elliot Montgomery is his name. And, um, and, uh, and so the, the language is evolving. And um, I guess, from my, from my opinion, all we can do is try and like, it, make it more, um, uh, we can pay, we can contribute our efforts to try and elevate in what I would consider elevate the conversation to try and get deeper. To get deeper, we need to have the vocabulary, we need to have the concepts. And that's been happening since day one. I think it's just a process. Yeah. And worth noting too that we we experienced the time during the pandemic. Like we m many of us basically live together. You know, my dorm is right upstairs. My next door neighbors are the same next door neighbors in my studio. 
So it's like a big social experiment that we're experiencing at Cranbrook. Chris Petter and I lived in Sally's house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, there you we go. Have similar during our years. No way. <laughs> in 1998, 1999. You know, I want to mention one thing too. I've been to Prague a few times and one thing that really impressed me about Prague was how international students visit the city. I ended up going clubbing in the five-story famous club in this old downtown area and it was a bunch of international students from all over the world attending conferences and like all kinds of um, language. Really, English was the primary language of discussion, but everyone was from everywhere. It was truly an international environment, which um, I was very impressed with when I was visiting Prague. Super. Thank you for answering it. <coughs> Anyone? Any more questions for Carla? I was going to say that the biggest asset to going to grad school is your peers. So yeah. beyond language, um, you know, you have professors and, you know, you have tools that are available to you, but what you will have that is unique is the people that study with you at that given time and um, where their careers will branch out to, because what's true about new media art and robotics and human computer interaction is that you can be a web developer, you could become an industrial designer again, you know, you can become a researcher, you can go off and um, do so many things. And so it's beautiful to um, connect with those students and, you know, see your opportunities multiply by friendship. Yeah, you can see on Carla and me that uh, some of the relationships uh, from grad school can continue for decades. So anyway, guys, we should also think about some uh, collaboration between those programs. Yes. We have to find some way, definitely. Yeah, I would love that. So if there are no any more questions, I would like to thank Carla. It was uh, fantastic. Also see the facilities, not only hearing about uh, all your work and work of the studio. And I hope we will really find a way how we can do something together between the schools. Yes, let's keep talking. Yep, yep. Thanks for making me part of the lecture series. I, I was uh, I posted for my students a link. It looks like you've been having some um, great and you have them archived. So there's some great lectures there. Great to have you. OK, greetings to Michigan. There's, this is the awkward Zoom moment. Yep, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm Thanks. hitting the red button now. Exactly. <laughs>